Every night, the principal cities of India go into Purda. In the great coast towns, lamps are dimmed. Lights in the bangle shops and the stores of the cigarette sellers are shaded. Paint and brown paper slow down the jingling tongas and garries and the motor cars. Light takes a siesta until the war is over. Six months before war, India revised her strategy. Her new frontier sweeps in a 6,000 mile arc from Egypt to Malaya. Ships of the Royal Indian Navy and the East Indies Squadron guard the sea approaches to India. Protecting Burma and Bengal, Indian soldiers stand by at the armed junction of the East, Singapore. In the West, they stand by at Suez, where barbarism already threatens Muslim lands. In 1941, security goes to the strong. Sirens? England laughed at them until 1940. Escapists still think it can't happen here. It can, and it may. That is why India's lights are dim, ARP organizations established in the big cities, mock air raids staged by voluntary wardens and firefighters. industrial country of the world, India's factories have moved into top gear, sending out her inexhaustible resources to freedom's battlefronts. From Tata Naga in Bihar, the greatest steelworks in the empire, flows more than a million tons of steel a year. India exports hundreds of millions of rounds of ammunition, exports rifles, howitzers, and anti-aircraft guns. She grows her own rubber, molds her own tires, for her own lorries dispatched to her armies overseas. The rough roads of Eritrea and Abyssinia, the great distances which mechanized units have to travel in India, the vast demands made by allied transports in every part of the world call for tires and trucks as tough as her fighting men. Motor chassis are imported from America. Picked artisans working fast fit on the Indian-made bodies. India's assembly plants are working overtime, running off 450 trucks a week. The modern mechanized army requires more and faster and more deadly machines. All these lorries, and only one man to be taken for a ride. Cotton cloth for shirts, shorts, and tunics. India's 400 mills average more than 4,000 million yards of cloth a year, an average already eclipsed by war production. Working two and three shifts a day, mills ream out cotton canvas for tents, ream out khaki drill, towel, and mosquito netting for General Wavell's forces. Tents and deserts can be cold places at night. Woolen power looms and hand looms, no longer competitors, weave military blankets, rugs, mufflers, undervests and pants for the Empire's armies. From the sweltering factories of India comes warmth for the forces across the seas. There are woolen socks as well, socks by the million, 
knitted by ingenious machines. hard fingers run up this canvas cloth. In modern dispersed warfare, thousands of small tents are called for. Indian craftsmen work long hours stitching them. With Fred and Bodkin, these men and women also fight. They fight the battle of the factories. Combatant casualties have been few in this war of lightning stabs and quizzling. But India is taking no chances. She is piling up a reserve of medical supplies. War research has found home-produced drugs and chemicals, aspirin, chloroform, ether, and vital vaccines. There are 40,000 items on the ordnance shopping list, more than half made in India. Rice and atta, wheat and sugar, packed in Bengal jute bags, are loaded for Indian troops overseas. Production has reached a record level. India increasingly uses her coal, iron, manganese, mica and bauxite, timber and water power. She now makes her own bicycles, gliders and aeroplanes, electric bulbs and cables, typewriters and sewing machines. India's shipyards build corvettes and other naval craft, riveting her safety on the seas. On the fabled coast of Coromandel, the largest shipyard in India has just been opened, symbol of India's industrial progress. War costs lakhs of rupees a day. Princes give minesweepers for the navy, clubs and rest camps for the army, ambulances for the wounded. Their squadrons roar across the skies in the Battle of Britain. War weeks in the large cities display Indo's army on parade. Huge crowds attended Bombay's war tattoo. Hundreds of thousands strong is Indo's new army, drawn from every creed, Sikhs, Christians, Muslims and Parsis, as well as Hindu fighting men from Maharashtra and Rajputana. True to their martial traditions, the Indian princes have sent their own armies to fight in this world war. Already 16 of their units serve alongside the forces of the Commonwealth. To the Royal Indian Navy go another 100,000 men, gunners, navigators, signalers, engineers. To the expanded Indian Air Force, hundreds of pilots and mechanics. To industry, tens of thousands of newly trained craftsmen. India excels in the arts of peace. In a battling material age, she is determined to preserve her ancient tranquil civilization, to keep intact the spirit of Indian life against the threat and barbaric ideals of the enemy.